Over the last, I don't know, 18 months, two years or so, uh, the State President's Council in particular have been really engaged on making sure that the dealers understand the uh, NAAA arbit arbitration uh, standards and, and rules for those. So uh, we've been kind of talking about what's the, what's the best place and time and forum to, um, to have that discussion. And we uh, said, hey, well, and AAA is located in Washington or just outside of Washington. And we're all coming to Washington. Let's do it at our Washington conference where we got the thought, industry thought leaders here um, at, at this conference this week. So really happy to... Uh, to have this opportunity. I first want to recognize Trisha Hion. Trisha, stand up, say hi, wave everybody. Trisha is here from NAAA. We're, uh, we're glad she's uh, joined us today. I want to introduce uh, Matt Arias, who is the Director of Arbitration for Mannheim, and next to him is Kurt Madvik, who's the Vice President of Auction Operations at Odessa. They are here to, in large part, answer your questions about this. So. This is one of those presentations where you need to be fully engaged and, and pepper them with the questions that you have. So we'll turn it over to Matt and Kurt, and they'll do a little warm-up, and then we'll uh, get microphones going around for, for Q&A. Take it away, guys. Thank you. We, uh, we, we appreciate having, uh, having us out talk about this. We had a really good session in Colorado a few months ago, and um, there were a lot of aha moments, I think. And I think one thing we're, we're big on is synchronization and uh, you know in in the spirit of uh, excellent jokes you know we were laughing earlier about uh, usually we call the fire alarm during the Q&A so they showed up a little early so. at least I got two laughs on that yeah one. so <laughs> you know a lot of stuff that we're talking about um, for obvious reasons some, some stuff that we have on the horizon in terms of NAAA policy and, and some another initiatives that we're working on is uh, we're really looking at the industry to see what kind of appetite is out there in terms of standardizing announcements at the auction, um, you know, what sustain or improve kind of things, obviously with the arbitration policy. Although this year we're really looking at letting the policy heal uh, and then maybe looking at some other things for next year as well. But uh, just it, the committee is, is a, a host of auction um, folks, and, but, but we all want to collaborate. And I think one thing that we, we really saw in Colorado is that, that, that need for interaction with all of you. So, you know, the Q&A was, was, was great. Um, not necessarily individual auction situations that we can maybe help you out of or help you with or whatever the case is, but more so policy questions or the philosophy on, you know, spirit of that, that type of thing or any kind of state law that may be in the way of the policy to us we need to know more about what's going on uh, to help you better so some of our folks from Colorado uh, wanted to tee up some things that maybe there's some stuff that we wanted to talk about in this session so we've got two mics going around Billy Graham's got one I've got one on the side of the room so just raise your hands we'll get you and we'll get going all right good morning um, in California, uh, we have an issue with export-only um, dealers, and uh, they get the license to, they're actually wholesalers, not dealers, they get a license to uh, purchase vehicles at the auction uh, with the purpose of exporting them out of the country. The problem that we see is that a lot of these export-only uh, dealers are not exporting the vehicles. What they're doing is they're selling them on the street illegally. So DMV will go after them and um, notify Mannheim or whatever auction they're buying at, and they'll not allow them to buy at that auction. Then what they do is they'll just go to the other auction and start buying there. Mm -hmm. So what we've, what we've asked uh, through our state association uh, is to see if there's a way that Action ox Access might be able to ban them from all auctions. And then our association is gonna work with the independent auctions that are not part of it to get them banned as well too. This way those folks can't go, and get, can't go buy vehicles from any of the auctions. In the last uh, five years, there's been over 12,000 uh, of these uh, um, violations that have occurred and that are being investigated by the Department of Motor Vehicles in California. So it's a, it's a really, really big issue in California. We haven't been able to get too far on it, so I'm not sure uh, you know, where we can move forward from this or who might be able to. I know we started talking to people at Action Access, but nothing's happened. Well, I think 
you know, curb stoning has always been an issue, right? So we're, we're, we're certainly um, willing to help look into it. Auction access is not necessarily a, an auction controlled thing, but we certainly can uh, help with the dialogue and go from there. Who or anybody, if you, I mean, is there anybody as far as next steps or who have you? Yeah, if, we, if, if someone could, uh, if I can get a contact info, I can have Larry Laskowski, who's our executive director. Okay. Um, reach out to maybe yourself. Or, or, or somewhere, wherever you, you feel would be good, mm -hmm. so we can start the dialogue. Okay, yeah. Can I get your uh, contact info? Sure. Or is that out of here somewhere? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give all that out. At the end? At the tail end, yeah. Okay, appreciate yeah. it, thank you. We have a situation in Oregon where we have a lawyer that has, uh, he somehow gets access to um, Mannheim's uh, disclosures. Now, you have insurance companies that are repairing consumers' cars, thousands of them a day, repairing structural components. The cars, a lot of consumers don't know about the diminished value, you know, that they could be uh, uh, entitled to, so forth. They just want their car fixed. They trade it into a dealer, and maybe this body shop that did the repairs didn't disclose it to Carfax or doesn't have a uh, deal. So anyway, car now goes through NAAA's rules. This car's got frame damage. So the auction, to protect their liability aspect of it, they write on the invoice disclosed frame damage. This attorney gets a hold of that. And... And a lot of times, the rules that NAAA is putting in force in describing frame damage mm -hmm. could be something as simple as the door pillar post. The hinge was off kilter, and when the door slams, it got damaged and bent the, stri uh, the striker. So anyway, that's repaired, and it, they're calling that structural frame. Well, this attorney, and I believe his website is wisucardealers.com. Okay. <laughs> gets a hold of this information, and now the dealer, he takes this car back, okay, I was frame damage or whatever, and they can't find anything wrong with it except this, you know, this mechanical failure that caused the damage and so forth. The next thing you know, this attorney contacts the consumer, he follows the car. Once that title hits DMV, he gets the information from DMV on that VIN number and then contacts him, and now, you know, there, the process starts. You know, this wasn't disclosed to you that it has frame damage. And now NAAA's rules are looking at as gossipal that yet, on the other hand, the insurance companies are repairing these consumers' cars, thousands of them a day, mm -hmm. with structural frame damage. So I guess that we need to get the two in harmony as to a real clear definition of what is frame damage instead of allowing uh, attorneys to use NAAA's rules as a uh, line in the sand for this, this type of damage. Well, structural damage in terms of the NAAA policy, um, and it's, it's morphed over time, but the policy is in line with, and you think about auction houses, they have to contend with <clears throat> roughly 504 makes and models. You know, so the shotgun rules into a 16-page document, 14-page document for structural damage, it's pretty simple. Is the structural component kinked or is it bent? If it's kinked, it's considered permanent damage, therefore requires disclosure. If it's bent, it gets noted from a liability point of view and obviously set the appropriate expectations with buyers and sellers from, a, from an auction inspection. And from there, it's permanent until, yes, it can be repaired, certain things can be repaired, certain things will require replacement. We have no control after it leaves the gates what happens to that vehicle in terms of its repair or replacement. So in terms of that announcement falling off or following that retail deal, we really don't know. This is not uh, atypical. This happened in California, if I'm not mistaken. There was um, a few years back, same group, maybe probably a different website name, although that's very catchy, but the, the idea was they were getting auction announcements, not just from Mannheim, but all auction announcements, reaching out to retail folks and then saying, was this disclosed to you? If not, 
here's a list of attorneys that can help you sue. And they're selling the leads for $1,500 a pop. Obviously. And it's still happening. Yeah. So, you know, what, what are we doing? Or what, is, what, are, what, what are you doing to, to prevent that? You know, maybe there's some best practices in California. Obviously, disclosing that in a retail deal would help. Maybe not buying a structural damage vehicle. Or if the vehicle is repaired, just as long as it measures within the vehicle um, specifications, by way of 3D measuring, just like any typical retail collision shop would do, follows the OEM procedures, then the vehicle is certified, repaired, or replaced. Then there is no structural damage at that point. There will be some history on it, of course, um, whether you know the different data history companies are out there. But in terms of the announcement at the time of sale, that vehicle does have structural damage and will require disclosure. In terms of after it leaves the gates, you know, we, we really don't have control of that. Fifth wheel installation where they've yep. drilled holes in, in the frame to install an aftermarket <laughs> component is being called frame damage. And branding, essentially you're branding this vehicle. Right. You know, so, and it's not a really, it's not a legitimate brand in the sense of, that it is, um, that's going to follow the car, but it's, you know, it's not going to brand on the title, but you've branded a history on, on a vehicle mm -hmm. that, um, I mean, that aftermarket companies are installing right down to these uh, commercial vans that have had um, uh, cabinets installed in them, and then they've removed them because of the cost, moved them to the next vehicle. You're calling that frame damage. Well, there's, there's, there's three disclosures that NAAA uses. There's structural damage, which is the overarching vehicle has structure. Uh, structural damage. There's the structural alteration, which would probably be more appropriate for that situation. Drilling holes into a structural component is, is not necessarily a good thing, right? Water ingress, obviously you, you're re-engineering the, the spacing of the vehicle. There's a certain fulcrum change. There's a lot of re-engineering that's going on with the structural components. Now, there are some exemptions in terms of pilot holes, less, you know, a quarter inch or smaller things like that. However, fifth wheel hitches, receiver hitches, gooseneck, any kind of plows, any kind of alteration, that should be a structural alteration. Well, it's still a brand and it's very appropriate if it's not an OEM blessed installation method, which there are very few in terms of drilling and welding, then it'll follow. But structural damage, you know, and the guidance we typically give auctions is if it's a complete hack job, then maybe structural damage is more of an appropriate disclosure requirement as opposed to, say, structural alteration. It's a little outside the spirit of the policy. So quite possibly there's some education needed for, you know, maybe that, that particular transaction or what have you, or maybe, you know. Can I say something? <laughs> we do this all it, the time. It's the Matt show here. Um, you know, the... the the situation you're talking about is, is, applies to a lot of, I'm sure a lot of the questions we're going to have today, is it, it is to some degree subjective, but as part of our responsibility of the auction and the intentions of what, you know, our committee that we run for the standards for the auction is to make the transaction as transparent as possible. And so you, as the purchaser of the vehicle or you as the seller of the vehicle may not necessarily agree with the specifics of how we how we do it but what we're trying to do is the best that we can to make it transparent so that all parties involved at least have an understanding of what the situation is so in the case of you know typically when we say structural damage a lot of customers will then add you know let's just say commentary to what goes after that. So if you say that, you know, you've got an F-250 that's coming across the block and it says structural announce or structural, uh, structural modification or alteration, uh, fifth wheel hitch added, most buyers aren't going to even bat an eye at that. Now, if I just say it's got a, you know, structural damage to it, then people are going to be concerned of what's, what's the, the safety of that vehicle. And so that's what we're trying to do is, um, you know, once that information then goes out and then is distributed because we distribute to uh, AutoCheck, Experian, um, but we have a lot of sellers now that are taking that information and they're 
providing those auction disclosures directly to Carfax. Um, it's not coming from us, but how that is then portrayed in those vehicle history reports isn't always up to us as to how it's disclosed. But you know, all, all we're trying to do is be transparent as much as we can for the transaction. You know, if we're aware of what that situation is, then all we're trying to do is disclose it to both the buyer and, you know, eventually someone else that may want to buy the vehicle, at least they know what the condition was. Matt, it's, uh, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you again, uh, Matt. Matt, I'm from Colorado, and I kind of set up the, the scenario on the way we got involved in it. Colorado is a disclosure state. So we were kind of having a problem at, with the auctions and the disclosures and dealer to dealer, and we were kind of looking for a def definition. Matt was graciously to put in the magazine that if you had any questions or concerns to contact them, and of course we sent them about a thousand emails, and, <laughs> and he graciously responded. And Karen came out uh, along with Matt. Uh, Kurt was unable to make that meeting with us. We had another local auction that attended, and we had about 25, 30 people in attendance uh, to ask questions. Uh, it was a, supposed to be like an hour meeting that I think we spent about four hours in. Uh, very informative, and I think very eye-opening for both the dealer side and the auction side. Uh, unfortunately, I think what we learned is we're not always gonna agree with what their decision's gonna be. Uh, but we were kind of looking for a happy medium. And I, and I think that's what we learned together. We could operate with the auctions and the dealer group to come up with a consensus on how things need to be disclosed. And, you know, I don't think they want to call frame on a car that's framed that we weren't aware of. But if it's there, it's got to be disclosed, and that should kind of portray down the road. So one of our issues we had was was like uh, we have material disclosures in our state, uh, hail damage, uh, things being repaired to cars. We've worked now together with Matt. We've kind of bounced some ideas off on, on how to set a hail policy. What's going to be hail? What's not going to be hail? Uh, yeah, because we have to disclose that in our state, even if it's repaired, PDR, or body work. So we're kind of trying to work up with a happy medium. Um, I, it was, it, like I said, it was very eye-opening. And one of the things I'd like to ask you today, Matt, is, you know, obviously we've got all these flood cars. Mm -hmm. um, what is the position going to be now? I mean, obviously we had cash for clunkers where they took good quality working vehicles and crushed them. Yep. And now we're going to have millions of flood damaged cars that most of us don't want to see back on the road. Will you guys have the opinion of that those cars should be permanent removed, destroyed, or, you know, salvaged and resold at the auction, because obviously you'll have to dispose of most of those at, through the insurances. Well, I'll go first. Um, you know, one of the things that we've, we've seen so far with, um, on the, the Houston side with Harvey is you know, they were saying uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, half a million vehicles have been uh, potentially flooded out. Uh, with our sister company, Insurance Auto Auctions, we, we have uh, cat response teams that go to these different events and we'll set up, um, I'm sure you've seen them in USA Today and that where they've got drones flying over some of our lots that we have. Um, you know, we've, we have to lease space to process these vehicles. It depends on the condition of the vehicle and how bad it is as to what the insurance company will do with it. They may just crush it, or if they feel that there is, you know, significant value still left in the vehicle in regards to parts in that, then they'll sell it that way and process it. Uh, the, the good thing with those is you have that permanent brand on the vehicle and you have that vehicle history report because we then, um, you know, uh, disclose to, um, all the different agencies that we have to. The, the concern that we're starting to see with, with Harvey, though, is our estimates based on a half million vehicles and what we expected to get back, uh, we're not getting as many vehicles as we thought. And that's because they're starting to realize that in the, that area, there was a large uninsured uh, population of vehicles. 
And that's where our biggest concern is, is those vehicles now, since they're not getting processed by an insurance company, the owners are having to then take them to, you know, folks like yourselves in here and trade them in. And they're probably going to try and clean them up the best they can. And then those vehicles are going to end up, you know, somehow going, coming through the wholesale channel. And we're going to have to identify them. Uh, we are working with uh, Experian. We get a report. Each of our auctions will get a report on a daily basis of vehicles that they have in their inventory that were registered in that area where there was a catastrophe. And then we can go out and look at those vehicles to then identify, uh, you know, does this vehicle have true flood or not? Now, you know, uh, my GM in Austin called me uh, last week and said, you know, I got 30 cars here. What am I supposed to do? I'm like, well, you're going to have a lot of cars. And I'm not too concerned right now about yours, but uh, my auction in Minneapolis, that if they get two of them, I hope that they go out and look at those cars right away. And they dig into them pretty thoroughly to make sure that, you know, that vehicle has not had flood damage and isn't getting, you know, shipped around to try and, you know, take advantage of the situation. We made a change with the arbitration policy and it was effective September 5th. And what we did with that is um, there are two ways of detection in terms of flood damage from an AAA policy point of view. One of them is DMV records, insurance records. So that's still intact. And uh, um, as needed, we can uh, look through the data history and of course ISO and some of those other sources to better determine if there's a claim against it or any kind of history relative to flood. The other one is um, by auction inspection. So to Kurt's point, the Harvey report um, or any kind of uh, product that any of the auction companies have in terms of a flood inspection goes, um, we'll look for it. Of course, there's arbitration recourse. Unfortunately, in arbitration, it's too late, right? Vehicle's already been purchased and then, you know, we're catching it via post-sale inspection or flood inspection or whatever the case is. But we are going to brand those just like normal and make sure that um, if somebody pickled the vehicle, try to keep it, clean it up, flush the fluids or any kind of stuff like that, we're going to keep our um, eyes peeled. You know, there are 48 storms roughly every year where vehicles are exposed to this kind of condition where water is rising into the wheel wells or I'm sorry, over the rocker panels or getting into things. And so, you know, while hurricanes and, and big events like this certainly heighten our awareness. You know, we're always trying to stay on point in terms of um, the detection methods from a visual uh, point of view. I actually have a, a, a couple things. One on the um, structural damage, structural alteration. However you can educate the auctions, for God's sakes. I, I disclose and I'd say for, probably everybody in here does, but it sure is a lot easier to say it's stru structural altercation because that F-250 had a, a hitch put in the bed when you say stressful damage, it's scary. It's scary. Yeah. So if that is what it is, if they would please announce what it is instead mm -hmm. of just saying, you know what, just put structural damage on it. It's no big deal to us. It is a big deal to us at the at the point of sale. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, everybody in this room knows my passion for the last four years has been the 10-year odometer exempt rule. Mm. Auctions do not help us with that for whatever reason. And I've had situations... Uh, I personally bought a vehicle at an auction. Doesn't matter, one of the big ones, but it really doesn't matter. They're all the same. Got it home, I made the mistake of not running a history report before I bought it. I got it home, it was a 110,000 mile vehicle that was really a 240,000 mile vehicle, okay? When I went back to the GM who, I, I'm, I've been in the business 40 years, so I, I know a lot of people, a friend of mine, told him about the, the transaction. He looked at me, it was a new car dealer that was selling the car. He said, Billy, unless you can tell me, or, and, you know, prove to me that the new car store knew that if the mileage was altered, I can't do anything or I won't do anything about it. And I looked at him, uh, you guys know. I said, what new car dealer do you know that doesn't either run Carfax or auto check on every trade-in? Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, if we make the mistake now and then of not catching it, we're the ones that eat it and customers are getting defrauded out of billions of dollars a year, we all know that. I would love to, to see something done that, where the auction takes a little bit of a stand and says, hey guys, y'all can't do this. And, and that particular transaction, when I got the title, it went from a used car dealer to the new car dealer to me on the same day. So we all know in this room what happened. The new car dealer knew that he wouldn't get arbitrated, so 
he sold the car for his buddy, and I ended up with it. It's a that's a sticky pickle right there, I, and you know obviously we're we well, try to. I, I will say that uh, Sean's been helping me. We've we've had conversation with Nitsa, and we're trying to get it okay. rolled back to 25 years. Oh. So I, I mean, hey, listen, from 90 basically up, there's six-digit odometers. There's no reason for that antiquated law to be in in place. Right. Yeah. Over mechanical limits. When's the last time you dealt with that? <laughs> Yeah, no, it, that's, you know, one of many that, you know, as, a, as an intermediary, the auctions try to do the right thing, want to do the right thing. There's a certain fraudulent omission versus plausible deniability line, right, that we try to play it, you know, nice with. And we try to help as best as we can, and that's tough. That's a tough one. Without absolute knowledge, you know, it's really hard for us to push back hard. Not difficult. I mean, that one was pretty obvious. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, well. was it was it sold exempt? Of course it was. Okay. That might get okay. No. Well, <laughs> depends. I mean, what? It, well, exempt and TMU are two different things. Mm -hmm. We stand by the policy. Policy's written basically. If there's any known omission on a vehicle that's exempt, then we will arbitrate back to the seller. Known, that's the big key word there. How do we prove that without a shadow of a doubt? If you're a seller and we hit you with that and you say no, we, we say we don't believe you, you're gonna have it, it's tough. Is it right that somebody hides behind that? No, absolutely not. We, won't, we, we tend to not let people hide behind sail lights and things like that. We want to do the right thing, obviously. We have rule number one, right? Fair and ethical sale. We have the right to cancel it. If we feel that it's not an ethical deal, then we'll, we'll stop the sale. Do you not believe the car banks and check? Do you believe they're wrong? Do I believe they're wrong? Yeah, but you, you run, the dealers run, or options run, the, the, the car check before they go through. Why do you sell it an exam? Why is that not brought to the attention then? We don't run Carfax. Auto check. Okay. If, if there's nothing in auto check, then what do we do? Not everything's picked up in auto check to some of this data history. But legally, that's what exempt is. Yeah. Exempt saying that there's whatever the mileage reads doesn't matter anymore because it's exempt now. That's not so really it's true. If it has been altered, that's TMU. That's not exempt. Thanks. If true. But the TMU brand went through, yeah. Yeah. Why could you, why could you not run <clears throat> on a TMU vehicle? you have an auction access report for salvage, you know, you pull it, and it's got the last recorded odometer on that, in most cases, on that title on the front. On a TMU vehicle, why could you not it goes, set an auction policy that recorded the last reported mileage on the windshield as it goes through? If the auction does that, it would, it would eliminate the problem very simply. Now, known TMU does get announced. Known TMU. But I'm mm -hmm. talking about if it's an exempt vehicle over mm -hmm. 10 years, if you put the last recorded mileage, just says you know, uh, LMR, LRM, and then put the last recorded mileage on the front of the title, then if it had 240,000 miles like Billy said on the front of the title and 110,000 on the odometer, then you know it's uh, it's TMU and not just exempt. Right. Tough question. Right. Uh, no, it is tough. No, I know, I know we're, not, we're not solutioning today or here now, but it's definitely good. That's very good feedback. Absolutely. We're working on it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... The, well, that's, that's <laughs> our on. job is, as part of the co-chairs for our committee, is we find things like that. That's our job to take it back to our, our association and figure out what, what modifications we need to make. We've been making modifications annually for the last four years and um, trying to balance the, the power of, um, you know, people think that we're more slated to the buyer or more slated towards the seller. And, and we've spent the last probably five, six years just trying to balance that and equal out all parties, whether they're online or physically in the sale and that. And we kind of, we're trying to take a hiatus for this year, as Matt was saying earlier, to kind of let things heal and kind of because we didn't also it kind of came across that every every year we were changing our rules and so we want to kind of make them let, let, let them just sit for a little bit and 
you know, we'll take into consideration the other things, but this is a great example of, you know, where we'll sit and we'll go back and go, okay, hey, you know, what do we think we need to do about this? Because, I mean, like I said, we want to make it a fair and transparent transaction for everyone. It just helps everybody, and it, yeah. it, it would help the used car industry. The average car is on the road now, the average owner 11 years, is that right? Mm -hmm. So that falls yep. right into the exempt. And yep. I sell a lot of trucks that still have a 15, 20, 25,000 dollar value, but I'm having to sell a lot of them exempt because that's the way the title comes to me. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it's a tough problem. It is. Yeah. Uh, I run an auction and I would say, uh, listen to these guys, to back it up a few years, uh, because I sit and watch guys use that exempt rule to their advantage. So I think it would help these guys out. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, the known, we struggle with the did you know or did you not know, you know, without bright lights and chaining somebody to the desk to ascertain the truth. I'm putting a lot of pressure on Sean, so. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joe. I'm with uh, G Motor Cars in the uh, Chicagoland area. We sell a lot of uh, commercial trucks, and I've had uh, a lot of inconsistencies in Chevy Express vans and kind of lines coming in with bins. Some have bins, some don't have bins. Some auctions are calling them, they're not calling them structural alteration, they're calling them structural damage. I can give you the auctions Mannheim, Chicago, Mannheim, Milwaukee. Odessa, Chicago does not call them structural damage. When I'm selling this vehicle and we present a Carfax or an auto check, and it is hitting the Carfax in, in certain auctions, I don't, it, it, it's doing Sellers. it. Sellers. What's that? Sellers. Sellers, okay. Mm -hmm. You guys should work with Carfax and auto check in, in maybe called structural alteration equipment install. Because I have to sit there and tell the customer, first of all, they don't believe me because I'm a car salesman. <laughs> Number two, I, it's true. I can have as many awards on my wall as you, you want, and they're still not going to believe me. But what I do is I have to, I, we, uh, we print out the condition report, mm -hmm. and we keep it with the truck. So when we pull the deal jacket out and I show them here, this is why this is being called that. Now, an express van and a, 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 an Econoline, that's a body on frame vehicle, okay? Mm -hmm. Has there ever been any data with a dummy in it, with the cabinets in it, and the cabinets without it after it's been drilled, gone to the crash and see if the occupants were less protected because of these cabinets from Adri Adrian Steele or, or WeatherGuard or whatever? Sure. Has there been proven data that the occupant is not protected as much if the holes were drilled there for, for the cabinets. I don't think there's ever been a study on that. And the reason why you guys, we call cars frame is for, is for legalities. I mean, if somebody gets killed because there was a structural alteration, you know, as long as it was announced, then you're okay. Uh, well, nobody's okay, but y you know what I'm saying? It, you're, we're doing it to protect, everyone's doing it to protect themselves because we're in a, su uh, a suing society, okay? But I don't think there's actual data out there to show that having a snowplow mount in the front of a Silverado and F-250 um, uh, may have less protected the occupants in a frontal collision. So on conventional frames, any kind of drilling into the panels shouldn't matter because for conventional frames or body on frames, we're describing them, mm -hmm. there is no structural damage requirement for something that's not structural. So we could probably take that offline and look at those vehicles and make sure that we're talking about it, you know, because uh, there are some unibody on frame and then of course unitized structures where that disclosure will be required because they are structural components in terms of drilling. In terms of uh, crash testing, while they're not doing any crash testing typically on, on vans that have an empty void in the back from a cargo point of view, from an occupant point of view, right, they're not gonna, it doesn't matter. However, snow plows or any kind of welding, drilling into, into the structure itself absolutely does weaken. And in the front section, just to get nerdy for just a minute, I'm sorry, you're gonna mess with airbag timing. Because what you're doing is you're either, depending on the weld quality, the invasiveness of the welds, and everything that goes along with that, it's gonna get in the way of that 0.1 second timing, that dance that from Sufficient forward deceleration to, okay, the system recognizes we're in a crash, deploy airbags. 
if you have a structure that's been altered too stiff or too weak, mm -hmm. it's going to change that dance. And the airbag's either not going to go off or it's going to go off too soon for those to have it. Any vehicle, 1999 or, old or newer, will have that situation. So we tend to look at those pretty hardcore. Now, somebody is welding a snowplow or some of those you know, additions, they're not going to go, well, what's the NAAA policy say about that? Maybe I shouldn't do that. But of course, they're not. So this is something we have to keep eyes on. But it absolutely does affect elements of the structure as well as uh, ancillary things like the supplemental restraint system. Uh, how, many, how many guys have actually bought a, uh, uh, a dually with a uh, fifth wheel in the back and it was called structural damage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, don't you think maybe structural, like I said, structural alterations, equipment installed may be a better way? As a consumer who's sitting in front of me, I can explain this a little better than yep. saying structural damage. Now, I don't know of anybody who's been able to get it reversed because the interpretation of what is what is different at every single auction. Yep. And we, we use it, sometimes I use it to my advantage when we have one auction saying, when we bought a car and they say, hey, now nah, that ain't structural damage. Oh, we'll just send it to Mannheim, Milwaukee. We won't even say anything. And we'll send it up there and it gets labeled structural damage, and we'll call back down, say, Mannheim Arena and say, hey, your, your, your brother up there just said it's mm -hmm. uh, structural uh, you know, damage. It's the interpretation. I, I know it's very difficult, I know, but in a, in a commercial truck standpoint, that might be something in the future to look at, so it doesn't, uh, here's the other thing is financing. A lot of banks are saying if, if the Carfax or the auto check says it's got frame damage, they're going to bounce the contract. Mm -hmm. You know, you just told me that that cargo van, we, and we inspect our vehicles, did not have structural damage. It was structural alteration. It had Adrian steel cabinets put in there. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I, could send it, and I, I had to sit there and talk and talk with the guy and say, sure. this, is, this is why, and showing, showing the, uh, the, the CR. But um, it's killing, it, it kills the values of, of our vehicles. It kills what we're, we're doing. And then what I was getting at was that you said the seller is the one who made that announcement. To okay. Carfax. To Carfax. But is it truly structural damage if it met all the uh, NAAA rules? How do I get it reversed? Has anyone ever got it reversed? The, the only way to get it reversed is if the auction that made the disclosure um, looks at the vehicle and will go back to Experian Auto Check to tell them that it was incorrect. Now, doing that though means that the seller now has to agree that they're willing to do it because obviously they sold the car at a price that was discounted for the structural damage. It was so discounted. The, <laughs> so for yeah. the buyer to, to be able to say, hey, it's not structural damage and right. you know, get it fixed and all that, you know, now there becomes an issue with us as our responsibility to the seller as well. So that's what makes it difficult for us. But um, the, the interesting part, um, what you were saying earlier about the, um, the cabinets, um, crap, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, Matt, you can make comments if you want. No, there's something else. <laughs> And I'm starting to write oh, wait, down my you said notes. Adrian said Adrian. All right, that's different. That changes things. <laughs> no. Well, I think one thing that we've, and we see a lot of, right, was a lot of these fleet vehicles that are turned back and, and we're buying them um, or selling them at the auction. And they do have a lot of modifications in there. And there is so many modification types, you know, to get into. And part of what we're, we're thinking about this year and uh, next year, of course, is that standardized announcement. So this fits perfectly into kind of what we're thinking, right? You don't need to go and buy a Rosetta Stone for every auction that you go to because you have to decipher what kind of announcements are out there. If you wanted something, and I think I think all of us, and I see heads shaking, yes, something that we want to explore that it would help all of you with consistent disclosures. And obviously from a policy interpretation, you know, there's an education that goes along with that. Would, that's something that I think you would all benefit from is having that crystal clear, I know what I'm getting into before you bought the vehicle. In terms of Carfax, AutoCheck, and some of the others, there may be some translation from what an auction seller 
our seller most part is announcing versus what's picked up and translated into some line item in the report. Mm -hmm. So structural alteration, hitch, doesn't necessarily translate to auto check exactly, right? Or Carfax, and I don't know the exact thing. However, that's also worth exploring as well. Yeah, you'd have to communicate with them. To yeah. That. And, and there are bones of this, and sure. you know, there's, there's been some changes that we've seen it, uh, especially in car picks now, if there's not an accident, but it's other damage disclosed now. So I'm sure you guys can get that together. One, one of the, that prompted me to remember was, as we talked about the standardized auction, the announcements was getting to we've been talking with Experian of being able to add more of a commentary to the end of the structural announcement so that the consumer can see that hey it's structural for the fifth wheel attachment um, things like that so we've been in discussions with them but it's obviously to to do that is not as easy as you may think because we all have different computer systems. There's you know, logic built into all of them and in the files that are sent there. And then on Carfax's side, they're getting it from the sellers via text files, and they're actually reading and interpreting. So that becomes difficult on that side. But I think with the experience side for auto check, uh, probably within a couple of years, we probably can get to the point where there'll be some sort of commentary at the end of it. Now that does bring into, um, you know, I would say some of our commercial sellers will go and say, okay, we've noted where we see that there's damage, but they may just say, hey, we just want to announce structural damage because if we say that it's the, you know, let's say the, the right quarter panel, but there's other damage there, does that get them, because I, I announced structural damage right quarter, does that mean that now the left quarter found out that was replaced as well can I still arbitrate that or is that structural? So that's kind of, it's a double-edged sword to figure out how we solve that one. Got a question over here. I'm gonna add real quick though. I, I know you I know y'all have a relationship with Experian and that's fine, mm -hmm. but understand out on the front lines, 90% of us out here, 90% of our customers have never heard of AutoCheck. Most of our customers are Carfax driven. We deal with Carfax because that's who's branded the public and that's who the public knows when they talk about a history report, 95% of the time, 99% of the time, they're asking for Carfax. Yeah. So, you got Oregon, and then I've got another question here. I think that, um, you know, the key word is when you throw in structural, that's what sends mm -hmm. a lender into a tailspin, having to resell it to your customer who already has a somewhat of a distrust, you know, right off the bat using the word structural when you could just simply say modified and then add the hitch installed, modified cabinets removed, modified, you know, a fifth wheel removed or installed, you know, those kinds of things. Just use the word modified and uh, instead of getting into structural because the car hasn't been, when you use structural, that means that the car has been in some kind of an accident. You know, I mean, that's the, the first thought that comes to everybody's mind, that that car has been in some kind of a collision. Just you, and it's a modification. That's all it is. Simple modification, installed a snowplow. Modified, hitch installed. Modified, trailer hitch removed. You know, those, just that simple word. Sometimes KISS works better. Just one more reason to live down south where we don't have to worry about the snowplows. <laughs> <laughs> They're a lot of fun. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Just so uh, you kind of you kind of glazed over something when you were talking about the way the seller reports through Carfax and mm -hmm. it's interpreted differently. Can you uh, elaborate on that? Is because you said something about Carfax is reading the tech file. Do they make a judgment on whether something is is a structural or? It depends. Or it depends on the text that they're reading. So they're basically getting a file, a data file from the seller that may be one of our reports that they have in a PDF that they get sent to them. Um, and then their Carfax is parsing through that and they're having to interpret those announcements. How their algorithms interpret all that and what they determine gets added to their vehicle history report, I'm not familiar with that, but I know that's how they're getting the announcements into their uh, reports. And there's, uh, I know Toyota 
mm -hmm. sends. Who else uh, that are y'all's major sellers that send? I, I, there's a host of them. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with which. I, I know Toyota for sure. Um, Ford. Ford is as well. Um, I can't think of off the top of my head the others. It, it would be great if, um, if, if the reports kind of had the same information. You know, it, <laughs> it, if y'all could enter into uh, your auctions, I should yep. say, could enter into a deal with Carfax to receive the same information. Because it, it does, you know, if, if I use Carfax majority, which I do, mm -hmm. and the customer goes to CarMax to get that car appraised, the next thing you know, I have a, a fairly clean Carfax with maybe an accident or something, and they go to, to uh, the CarMax to sell this car, next thing you know, they're, they're hitting them with, hey, well, he's got structural damage from this accident. It's, it, it's a little, it, it's, it looks bad on us sure. because we can't, we can't afford to pay both. Um, and it's, uh, it's frustrating for the consumer and it, and it hurts the consumer. So we're having a, if, if everybody would be on the same page, it'd be a lot, a lot helpful, a lot more helpful to the yeah. I'll, I'll answer for, for Matt since uh, he's probably limited in what he can say, but you, the, the complexity uh, has been somewhat created by Carfax themselves of going from being just a vehicle history report to now being a vehicle listing service. So getting cooperation between the auction participants um, where they have ancillary businesses that might compete now makes it kind of hard for us as an industry to come to an agreement to support a competitor. They'll be at dinner tonight. I'm sorry, so you're saying because Cox on, owns, let's say, Auto Trader, yep. and because Carfax owns Carfax listings, yep then that creates a headbutt between the two. Yes. Well, creative abrasion. Yeah. <laughs> abrasion. That, that's, that's my words. I wanted to cover for Matt because he, it, it, it. as an industry, it, it, creates, it creates an issue with us to try and get the balance of it. And, and the, two, the two vehicle history reports are constantly going after data sources that they can make exclusive. So, to get them to the point where they're equal, that would literally be the same as, you know, all of you guys having to, you know, offer the same vehicles for same price, same disclosure, things like that. It's, they're competing businesses. They're going to go after, um, you know, Carfax is all about the, the public persona. They're spending all their money on the advertising. Uh, AutoCheck is more of just going after uh, the, the data and providing the service to the dealers. It's, it's almost gotten silly with this frame damage thing. <laughs> Last Two weeks ago, I bought a Cobalt that had a trailer hitch on the back, a little small trailer hitch, and they announced you know, frame damage, mm -hmm. and I bought it. And I also bought a 2017 car with 5,000 miles on it that had no announcements. I went into arbitration to arbitrate when I realized that the 2017 with 5,000 miles was driving like crazy, and apparently had been run over a curb, and it had subframe damage, it had an axle bent, and they said, well, that had nothing to do with arbitration, and it was obviously over $2,000 worth of damage. The cobalt on the other side that had the frame damage said, what, what is wrong with that? It's got no paint work. They said, well, it's got a trailer hitch on it. So on one hand, they're saying it's got frame damage on a, on a trailer hitch. On the other one, they're saying, well, you can't arbitrate that because it's a bolt-on subframe. You can bolt it on and bolt it back off. That's fine, but it's $2,000 worth of parts to put the car back together with no announcement, and they're saying they're legit. They're really flawed in the process. If the if the uh, the bolt-on components are not structural, so from a structural damage point of view, it's hard to call something structural that is not. Now that being said, engine cradles, subframe, formerly known as, if you know that damage affected what it's bolted to, you know, so that inspection, the guidance given is to not only look at that part but also look at what that part affected. Mm -hmm. So if there's any floor pan assembly damage any kind of mechanical issue that's over $500, which is the threshold for green light vehicles and yellow light only for powertrain, then there's arbitration recourse at that point. Now, a hitch installed on a unitized structure is definitely something that would lean more toward a damage point of view than, say, an alteration point of view for obvious reasons. 
bolting something through a floor pan here on borrowed time, right? Any kind of load, what have you. So it's kind of apples oranges, both of them. And I'll be if it's a Mannheim situation, I can talk offline with you. If it's Odessa, you know, then <laughs> Kirk could chime in. Anyhow, you should just say frame. It should say it's got a hitch on it. You know, it's got. Well, and, and, I, and to your point, I don't care what it is. If it's got three thousand dollars worth of damage done to it, it's a five thousand mile yeah. car. The auction should tell you something. We rely on, you know, a quick car going through the block to get right. a little more information. When they said, "Oh, they basically missed it," and they just didn't want to fess up to no. it. <laughs> My question is uh, based on uh, statistics and analytics. On NAAA.com, it's a good website, a lot of references, a lot of good blogs from Matt there, but there's really no statistics. And the reason I ask about statistics is, in the auto industry, we, could, we know who sells what, how many cars to who, blah, blah, blah. What I want to see is which auctions have the most structural announcements. Maybe there's something in a training point where AAA could, and AAA could say, you know what, you guys have a tremendous amount running through your lanes that are being now structural. Why is that? I mean, also like in versus franchise versus independent, who's getting more structural claim on the block by the auction? Mm. At what auctions? I mean, those statistics aren't available. Is it possible that we could see something like that in the future? Um, the the NAAA does quite a good job of doing year-end analytics, and they do provide that uh, for you know the the public to consume. But getting into specifics of a specific auction, what they're doing, uh, we always um, anonymize the data so that we don't we don't want an auction to feel negative or um, positive on what percentage of their cars are being sold as structural. Now, I will say that internally within our company. Uh, thanks to Mannheim providing auto grade to the industry for us to use, we actually look at each of our auctions and then we look at each of our inspectors. And we do comparisons to see, you know, let's say seller A is running cars at these three auctions and we'll look at what are the grades of, on average for those vehicles at those three auctions to make sure that we're seeing a consistency in the quality. Now, if you get to the Northeast versus the Midwest, you may see some tendencies in, in a slightly devalued, devalued auto grade. Um, but what we also do is then we look actually internally within each auction and look across the inspectors. So that if we see that you know someone, one inspector is writing significantly lower or significantly higher than the others, we then will address that to go back to, to look at training uh, issues to help with that. But um, you know some auctions are focused on more of the uh, lower end cars. So if your your average sale price is three thousand dollars or less and you're dealing with, you know, trades that you're selling, you're gonna have a higher instance of structural damage vehicles. That doesn't mean that you're calling the cars too hard. It's just that you're not running a thousand rental cars every other week. Um, you know, you're not doing just the, the aged inventory. So to get into those statistics it's kind of hard to give an answer to what I think you're looking for. I, I mean, to think about that one. Yeah, the mix, the mix really does have a big effect on, you know, how many calls are coming out of the different sales or even regions. You know, obviously you're gonna see a lot of flood damage stuff coming out of the, the border states down. So it's gonna be, it's, you know, it's hit and miss. And I think all auctions are looking at quality, obviously trying to improve both on the CR side of things and on the back end of the post-sale inspection pre-sale cert as well and there are times and I you know from a man I'm point of view we are absolutely laser focused on improving quality at all times of course so training is there and triple-a does host training um, and triple-a.com mm -hmm. of course and it is available for all of you as well um, some of you have gone through it and heard my nonsense before but so it's uh, it's, you know, education is always going to be a, a big part of, you know, why are some of these calls coming out? And a lot of times, arbitration reduction initiatives, you know, we're looking at the majority of the detection methods and the controls that are there, you know, quality always gets thrown in there. So I mean, it's something we're always looking at in the sense that we don't necessarily publish all the time, but something for, we can mm -hmm. take back to the committee for sure.
All right, thanks everybody. We are out of time, unfortunately. This has been a great session. I know that Kurt and Matt are gonna be around during the lunch mm -hmm. hour for sure, yep. so yep. make sure you grab them with any uh, additional questions that you have.